Hi there, and I'm your host, John Iverson. Welcome to the show. Our guest this week is the Transport Minister, Omar Alhabra. Minister, thanks for joining us. Hi, John. Thank you for the opportunity. No problem. So we, we're we chatting now at Thursday lunchtime. You are uh, scheduled to be in the lion's den at the Transport Committee later this afternoon. Um, it's a special meeting. It's looking at the flight disruptions and rail disruptions from before Christmas. Now, you and I spoke last Friday, and we you made the point that uh, some of the problems with uh, Sunwing Airlines in particular and Via Rail were, were weather-related. They were not systemic issues, such as we saw last summer. Sunwing's CEO said that the first conversation that he had with you was on January the 5th, uh, long after, I guess, the most of the uh, the main problems had been solved. Do you think this is a problem that the transport minister should be focused on, or was this the 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 mismanagement of one airline in particular? I think it's both, uh, John. Um, let me just be very clear. Um, I was personally involved with what had happened from day one. Uh, my office and Transport Canada has been in constant contact on a daily basis with Sunwing and other airlines and via rail. Um, so uh, I think if you ask Sunwing uh, if if they were confused about what the minister or uh, Transport Canada's position on what was happening, I think they'd tell you very clearly uh, they knew exactly where I stood. Um, so yes, um, I didn't have a personal conversation with the CEO until um, um, until the issue has uh, slowed down a bit because I felt it was not unnecessary to duplicate resources uh, in, the, in the midst of, uh, of dealing with the situation. Uh, but my office, uh, Transport Canada, were talking um, about my position, about my opinion directly with Sunwing on a daily basis. And you were clear with me last week that uh, that people who are conflating this issue with what happened last summer are wrong and that they are separate phenomena. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, look, again, I'm not saying there were no systemic issue this time around, but they were completely different than what we saw last summer. What we saw last summer was the restart after the acute phase of COVID, after massive shutdown and closure of the borders to uh, a 300% increase in demand for travel. We saw the entire sector falter uh, under that pressure. We saw problems with CATSA, the security screening uh, agency, CBSA, uh, NAV Canada, airports, airlines. This time around, um, it was an extreme weather, back to back, um, overlaying the busiest or one of the busiest times of the year, and bad decisions made by a few organizations that ended up stranding customers. And again, I don't want to dismiss that, but it's a it's a separate ordeal than what we saw last summer. So, so this is my opinion. The one thing in common is that we've seen airlines pushing the envelope, uh, risking delays and cancellations because the the uh, financial penalties are just not there. They haven't been penalized in the past for, for some of their uh, indiscretions. And not having the flexibility to respond when something goes wrong, like a weather event. Is that fair? I think, look, I think uh, the issue about the rules is debatable. Um, at the end of the day, um, rules were there and the airlines still uh, broke those rules and they are responsible when they break these rules. So the debate is if the fine was thousands of dollars higher, would it have prevented this or not? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a healthy discussion. What I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I take away that debate and say, okay, if there are any uh, uh, confusion about the rules, let's make sure we clarify them. If there's any confusion about the strength of the rules, let's make sure we st strengthen them. Uh, but I don't know if really, uh, you know, the, the issue is that the rules were broken. There were rules in place at the time and they were still broken. Um, as far as the um, slack uh, within the operation of the airlines, I, I acknowledge that, you know, everyone is dealing with uh, labor shortage, including airlines. But having said that, I think airlines should have been prepared for that, should have uh, had plans 
to ensure that the schedule they have, they're able to manage with additional resources if needed. So I agree that I think uh, in hindsight, uh, I would argue that airlines uh, made some unfortunate decisions when it came to their operations. So getting into the weeds a little bit on what the existing rules are and what might might change. I mean, you said this was unacceptable. Um, you have talked about strength, strengthening the Passenger Bill of Rights to put the onus on airlines rather than forcing passengers to, to apply for compensation after the fact. What changes are Canadian travellers likely to see as a result of what you've got in mind? Uh, stay tuned, John. Um, I, uh, I'm just cautious not to preemptively say the details because there's still ongoing discussions, including, by the way, feedback from parliamentarians uh, uh, about what specifically, uh, what specific strength or uh, improvements to the rules can be made. But I'll tell you, uh, they will fall under three categories. Clarification to avoid any confusion. Um, um, simplification to ensure that the Canadian Transportation Agency and the customers are able to have a, a much more efficient process uh, and that the onus needs to be more on the airlines rather than the passenger. And thirdly, strengthening. Are there additional uh, strengths to the tools or the rules that we have can be put in place? So the, you mentioned the federal regulator, the Canadian Transportation Agency. It's scheduled to see a budget cut or a sunsetting of its existing budget, yet it faces a, a huge backlog in complaints from last summer, and I guess from from uh, from Christmas too. Uh, and yet, it hardly it seems to have been robust when it comes to enforcement. Just penalties of just sixty-seven thousand dollars since April. You said you said to me last Friday you expect the law to be enforced. How do you propose to ensure that? Look, let me first talk about how we set up systems here in Canada, which I think for the most part work. It's important that we set up quasi-judicial or judicial bodies at an arm's length from government so they are able to do their investigations and enforcements uh, independently. Um, however, I would say the government's responsibility, my responsibility is to ensure that I work with the CTA to ensure that they have the resources that they need and that they're able to uh, enforce and follow the rules as efficiently and as smoothly as possible. And my commitment, and I've been talking to the CTA chair uh, throughout last year on identifying uh, ideas of how we can ensure that they have the resources that they need and how they can uh, process complaints if more efficiently. Uh, so stay tuned. There's also, in addition to the strengthening of the rules, as I said, we're working with the CTA on providing resources and uh, also on clarifying uh, the smoothness of the process. So the airlines were appearing before the, uh, the, the committee this morning and they were howling the fact that the, the regulation of passenger rights falls entirely on them. And their argument is that there should be the other players in the system, from, from CATSA, the security folks, to the CBSA, to NAV Canada, should, and the airports, they should all be, I guess, jointly responsible for making sure the system works. And when it doesn't work, they should be jointly responsible for compensation. Is there any chance of that? The other one thing I wanted to ask you about related, is there any chance of a bill of rights for rail passengers? First of all, uh, John, it's the airlines who get paid by the customers. And it's really important that the airlines have this direct relationship with their passengers to ensure uh, that their passengers are made whole or compensated when things don't, when the obligation of the airlines are not fulfilled. Um, I, of course, heard their feedback about what about and what about. Uh, that's something that I'm looking into. I'm working with agencies. I'll tell you, though, the one thing uh, that I have the power that I don't have with airlines, with government agencies, is I'm able to issue directive to, uh, to government agencies. For example, when it comes to CATSA, uh, it was within weeks uh, that all of the issues that existed had gone away for the most part. Um, the hiring had accelerated. Uh, the improvements on bottlenecks has, ha, had occurred. Uh, with VIA, I am able to issue directives to VIA. For example, they have compensated all uh, passengers that have been impacted. So while I hear airlines when they say this, but there are differences here. Uh, it's uh, really not a, a fair comparison. But 
obviously I'm always looking for ways to further improve the system. And what about a bill of rights for uh, for rail passengers? Uh, you mean for uh, rail? Yes, for rail passengers. Look, as I said, uh, there is uh, across the country, there's only one uh, one uh, rail company that provides uh, passenger services. It is Via. Uh, there are interprovincial or sorry, intercity uh, that are provincial jurisdictions. Those belong. The jurisdictions belong to the provinces. So when it comes to uh, interprovincial across country via is a crown corporation and I uh, government has the ability transport minister has the ability to issue directives um, having said that if if it comes down to further clarification I'm willing to look at this but at least I know that the government has levers to direct uh, via to f compensate and respond to issues that does not exist in the private sector with the airlines just looking more broadly at the, the airline sector, I mean, you, you uh, are able to control um, the amount of foreign competition that comes into this country, for example, for domestic airlines. Do you see any need to require that them to serve smaller markets? Um, you know, Air Canada suspended direct flights from Calgary to Regina and Saskatchewan. Um, airports like Fredericton and Halifax uh, say that they're losing flights. Um, I think regional airports are at 65% pre-pandemic capacity uh, compared to 85 to 90% for bigger airports. Is there a role here for the federal government to ensure that um, the big airlines don't just fly the most profitable routes? John, this is always an ongoing uh, healthy discussion or debate about the role of the federal government when it comes to um, uh, a, a marketplace, a private marketplace in the air sector. Uh, we obviously as a country made a decision that it's important that private airline companies are 50, at least 50% Canadian owned. Uh, that is important for jobs, that's important for our security, important for our economy. Um, and when we provided financial support to airlines in loans uh, during the pandemic, we made conditions, we put conditions on the airlines to ensure that regional connectivity is maintained uh, uh, when they receive these support. Now, when their support ended and airlines paid back, uh, those conditions have lifted. So it's now up to the private companies, airline operations to decide on their routes, but I'm constantly monitoring it. I'm constantly having these discussions with airlines saying, I hear regularly from regional communities about the lack of return of airline services. Um, but let me tell you what I find promising right now in the sector. There is, appears to be um, um, a growth in the competitive nature of the industry. And let me give you examples. Porter just announced that they're about to expand dramatically their services across the country. We have Flair uh, that started in the middle of the pandemic and is providing new services. We have a, a new airline called Lynx. We have a new airline called, called Jetliner. Uh, so there's a new optimism, at least from my perspective, about the competitive nature of the sector. Uh, now I'm following that closely. I, I would love to see competition stronger in the sector. I will do whatever I can as a regulator, as, uh, as government of Canada, to encourage more competition because ultimately that's one way of holding airlines accountable to ensure that they service uh, the community, communities that deserve those services. Right, but we, we have seen, for example, Air Canada buying bigger planes and you know essentially not flying some of these smaller routes, which clearly uh, the hub and spoke system but then clogs up the big airports, uh, Pearson and Vancouver, Calgary and, and Montreal, and contributes to this sclerosis that, that has uh, has afflicted the system. No. Again, I, you know, John, I am following this, and I, I I will concede that airlines have not yet returned the service that they had. Um, before the pandemic, and there are some communities, regional communities, who have not seen the return of the service they were accustomed to, and I have raised this with Air Canada. Um, again, I'm, you know, uh, is, is, is will there be a time when government uh, directs private companies um, who do not receive funding from the government to provide that service? 
Um, I think because I, I think if I were the airlines, I'd say, well, is, is taxpayers willing to uh, to subsidize uh, those routes? That's an ongoing discussion. I'm interested in your uh, thoughts. Certainly, I'm interested in my colleagues' thoughts about this. But I would like to see a healthy uh, competition where communities um, who need that service to be provided to them. But it, I mean, it's not a, a, a normal free market. Let's face it. I mean, if it was you would be allowing uh, foreign airlines, American airlines to come in and, and fly. Now, presumably, they would cherry pick the, the best routes, but, um, you know, they're not able to. And as a result, you have an outsized influence on the way this market operates. And what you're suggesting is that you're loath to, to use that influence. I am saying, uh, I'm actually sharing with you, uh, frankly and candidly, the, the the challenges in making that decision. And I am being uh, upfront about the the current situation. Having said that, but there is no really uh, a marketplace that is 100% free of regulation. Uh, and the airline sector has a unique nature to it. Um, uh, so... I think it's important to ensure on behalf of Canadians that there are regulations in place to protect uh, uh, the safety of Canadians, to protect the well-being of Canadians. Um, again, um, you're having, um, this is a, a, an interesting, I think, philosophical question about how much should the government be overly regulating the sector or how less should the uh, government be regulating the sector? I think we need to strike a fine line between protecting public policy objectives, but at the same time, letting the marketplace uh, operate efficiently uh, and be held accountable by the regulations and by its customers. Just to finish up, though, the, the, uh, the, the prob problem of recovering from the pandemic and getting everything back up and running again clearly was an issue and it created uh, created huge problems. Are you confident that going forward, those systemic issues have been solved and that Canadians could look forward to uh, travelling more smoothly in the in the coming summer? First, to your point, uh, John, the pandemic has had a massive uh, impact on our entire economy, but particularly the aviation sector. Um, you know, it's one of the few businesses that went down almost to zero at the height of the pandemic. Uh, and then we saw with the massive uh, surge of recovery uh, that um, the sector itself had difficulties coping. But at the height of the pandemic, we put in place measures to support and to avoid further deepening the challenges of, of the sector, whether it's wage uh, subsidies, whether it's uh, uh, financial loans and support to the airlines. I would you know, hate to see what it would have been like without uh, uh, that support. Now, uh, we saw challenges as the sector recovered quickly. Um, and there were unfortunate lessons that we learned. Um, I took that issue extremely seriously from the summer and even prior to that, John. Um, I've been working closely. I traveled to many airports. I've talked to many airlines throughout the summer, after the summer. I hosted a summit last fall that brought together the CEOs of airlines, of airports, of, of un uh, unions as well. And we talked about, okay, what did we learn? What can we do to ensure that it never happens again? What is the responsibility of the airlines? What's the responsibility of the airports? What's the responsibility of government? And um, look, again, we didn't see many of the problems during this Christmas rush that we saw last summer. Uh, having said that, I still feel that there is a, you know, a fragile recovery. Uh, labor shortage uh, continues to uh, uh, to. Uh, to strike the, uh, uh, particularly have an impact on the aviation sector, as we are seeing it across the, uh, uh, the country. We are also seeing some opportunities for improvements for the rules and regulations and, and, and clarifying the rules. So I don't want to, you know, I want customers to feel, passengers to feel that the sector is, they to understand that the, the government is paying close attention to what's happening, that we are proactive, that we did not wait till the Christmas storm to take action. The action has been uh, started uh, last year and there's ongoing work. So I feel, you know, confident that serious work is being done. Do I, you know, do I not, do I stop asking myself, is there more to be done? No, I'm ask, I ask myself every day, what else can be done? What else can I personally do as a minister to strengthen the system, to improve, 
protection for passengers' rights. That's why I welcome and invite my colleagues' uh, feedback. I welcome, you know, pundits like yourself and columnists like yourself who have, uh, you know, a perspective uh, to provide ideas. Um, and I will uh, continue to work on ensuring that we do everything we can to continue to strengthen the system. Okay, well, we appreciate your time. Uh, good luck this afternoon. You, I'm sure you're going to get plenty of feedback from your colleagues. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, bye.